Columbia's research. Gentlemen, welcome to both of you. Let me begin, uh, Alan, uh, with you, if I might. Uh, the whistleblower who is going to speak tomorrow, it seems from my notes, is mostly going to discuss the speed with which workers were being asked to work, the, the high quotas uh, to produce more aircraft than he felt the uh, Renton factory was able to do, but he doesn't seem to be speaking directly to the problem that brought down uh, those two 737 MAX aircraft. That's the MACS, the control system, uh, where there was apparently a software or an interface problem. So is, is he pointing to a cultural problem at Boeing that is, that is deeper than just a software problem on a single aircraft? Yeah, I, th I think so, and uh, we all know that uh, as you increase the work schedule and the, the pace, uh, the probability or possibility of human error on the production line increases, but you're absolutely right, uh, Tyler. The, there's Right now, there's no evidence that this contributed to the two crashes, uh, uh, Lion Air and Ethiopian Airlines. Uh, that was uh, primarily, from what I can tell, a problem with the uh, sensors, the angle of attack sensor, the software and, of course, the so-called uh, maneuvering characteristics augmentation system. And in my, to my mind, I think Boeing's going to do uh, many things to correct these problems. They need to do a couple more things, and we can talk about that sometime. Do you have a, 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 a an estimate as to when this aircraft might be certified by the FAA and uh, back in service globally, Alan? Well, I, I've said before, I, I think the... Uh, Claims that it'll be certified by January and back in the air by early March may be a little optimistic because we've got to remember, even though the FAA controls the certification in this country, they really do want buy-in from their counterparts around the world, the Canadians, the Europeans, and so on, and from the other stakeholders, the unions, the airlines, and of course the flying public. So I think it may be a little optimistic to think uh, you'll be able to buy a ticket and fly on a max uh, by early March, but we'll have to wait and see. I've also said I would, uh, I would hope they would look at, uh, uh, the FAA would look at their own regulations that require emergencies to right. be uh, urgent and unmistakable. I don't think they've quite solved that problem yet on the max. Uh, Carter, you have a buy on this stock with a $521 price target. Does a debate over the work culture and the pressure that may erupt around this whistleblower's testimony tomorrow on Capitol Hill, does that change at all your assessment of where the stock will go? Oh, 100%. I mean, look, there, you, you've got to kind of separate the short and long term here and say, okay, well, what's the immediate a thing that the stock market wants to see. They want to see the plane return to the sky, right? So return to service is just one, one piece to start moving forward in an evaluation of what the stock is worth. Then you've got to ask yourself, what's the company going to earn in a post-recovery scenario? And then the last question to ask, and, and you need answered longer term, is, well, what do you want to pay for it? And so if the company is deemed by the market to be taking unnecessary uh, levels of, you know, amounts of risk on, uh, then you would expect that to be reflected in the multiple. Now, the question and what's hard here is this, it's not a binary evaluation, you know. So uh, Boeing isn't the only company in the aerospace world that's been struggling with, you know, production rate increases on new airplanes. That's been actually pretty common across uh, the entire landscape. So, you know, it's, it's tough to say how much the market is going to incorporate into there, but of course it matters. This, um, this whistleblower is testifying about the production floor from 2018 to spring of 2019, and yet we've seen the um, orders and the, and the deliveries decline here. Um, what does that tell you about what the whistleblower is saying? And I, I don't know, there's a lot of people who work at Boeing. Um, insiders have told me that there is level on level of redundancy when it comes to safety checks and uh, mandated days off, days of rest, 12 hours in between shifts and things like that. Would you expect to see more whistleblowers coming to the table with claims about Boeing's work circumstances, Carter? Oh, look, 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 it's possible, right? I mean, but the, the period of time that we're talking about here uh, is back in late 2017, early 2018, right? So uh, since that time, Boeing, obviously because of the MAX situation, has slowed production and, and kind of caught back up. And what we see across the aerospace uh, universe, both at Boeing and at Airbus and, and in their supply chains, uh, is that, that that sort of breathing room has helped alleviate some of those pressures. Now, 
you know, whether or not, you know, that there will be, you know, other folks that come forward to say, yeah, it was a very tough work environment two years ago, uh, is kind of up in the air. You know, Alan, is it your sense that Boeing may have cut corners in, in an effort to get sales booked and, and, and that the marketers may have gotten ahead of the engineers? Yeah, I've said that before, and of course, this is really management's responsibility, but as uh, Carter pointed out, uh, uh, there's a teething problem with new aircraft. I looked at the statistics last night for the late model, not the MAX, but the late model Boeings versus the late model Airbuses, uh, and roughly they're comparable. <clears throat> the Boeing is slightly safer than the Airbus if you actually look at the number of fatal accidents per million hours. The other thing uh, everybody needs to keep in mind is that the FAA has said they're going to inspect every aircraft. This is very unusual before that plane is allowed to return to service. So uh, it'll be more than Boeing workers wor uh, uh, working overtime. The ins FAA inspectors are going to be very busy getting these airplanes back in the air. And I just hope they uh, also look at some of the design issues to make sure that the uh, failure modes are such that they will provide the pilots with uh, better information that they, they're getting now on right. the automation. Gentlemen, thanks to both of you, Alan and Carter. We appreciate your time. To Pleasure. the bond Thanks, market uh, now, and Rick Santelli yeah. tracking the action at the CME. Hi, Rick. Hi. You know, there's been a lot of data points today that I find very important. Now, today we had third quarter final productivity. The mid number was down three-tenths. It ended up down two-tenths, so it's officially the first quarter in negative territory since the end of December. However, when you went to the National Federation of Independent Business and their Optimum Index, it was much better news, up 2.3 to 104.7. That is the biggest month-over-month -month increase since May of 2018. We all remember, of course, the end of 2016, how businesses shot up in confidence when the administration was put in office in 16. Now, there's another index. This is a Zoo Economic Index in Germany, a Business Sentiment Index. And even though the headline number was down 19.9 on current situations, Situation. Future expectations moved up to 10.7. That is the best going all the way back to May of 2018. And one final thought, we all talk about soybeans and how the market and trade impacts agriculture. It's not a happy day. Looks like Brazil's crop of soybeans that comes in in early 2020 will be about 1.21 million tons, which is going to be 25% bigger than the U.S. crop at 96.6 million tons. First time that's ever happened. Contessa, back to you. All right, Rick, thank you. Coming up, the Golden Bears Golden Watch could be the most expensive ever sold at auction. We'll give you more details ahead. The Bond Report. Introducing a new podcast, ESPN Daily. When you want to go beyond your feed, when you want to get inside the score, when you want to get behind the highlight, there's ESPN Daily. Go deeper into the stories of the moment. Get the exclusive access and insider perspective that only ESPN can give you. ESPN Daily, hosted by me, Mina Kimes. Listen now to ESPN Daily on TuneIn. A lot of people aren't aware that TuneIn lets you listen to the same terrestrial stations that you pick up on your FM AM dial. Except you can hear them from anywhere. To see all the stations broadcasting in your area, find the local radio section on the home screen. Keep it local with TuneIn. The puck drops. Twelve players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture. But you wouldn't miss this for the world. TuneIn brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most. On tune in. To LeBron, slam dunk. The NBA is on Tune In Premium. Each week, Tune In picks an NBA game you just can't miss. The Miami Heat are taking their talents to Texas to take on the second year phenom, Luka Doncic, and the Dallas Mavericks. Back trying to make it 11 to 2. This Saturday, the Miami Heat are at the Dallas Mavericks. Tip off is at 8 30 p.m. Eastern. Search NBA on TuneIn to follow your favorite NBA team today. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. Got a block, hook, into the end zone for the touchdown. 
From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. In the stock market and in life, everything can change from one minute to the next. Be the first to hear the latest money news and market trends with CNBC on TuneIn. Wherever your day takes you. Listen to CNBC's full slate of programming, including shows like Fast Money, Squawk Box, and Mad Money with Jim Cramer. And when the next big business story breaks, CNBC lets you know with live updates and commentary. At the office, at home, or on the go. Search CNBC on TuneIn to listen. A gold watch going up for auction tonight could break the record for the most expensive watch ever sold at auction. And Robert Frank is watching the watch. Watch for us. Yes, time is money here. Jack Nicholas's gold Rolex hitting the auction block in just a few hours at a sale held by Phillips in association with Box and Russo. Now, watch experts say it could surpass the $17.8 million that Paul Newman's watch set in 2017. Now, this is the only watch that Nicholas wore for more than 50 years. It was on his wrist for 12 of his major championship presentations. Nicholas told us the watch can do more good now at auction since the proceeds will go to his children's charity. You know, it, to me, I missed this one. But, uh, and, and, but I know it's going to do a lot more good than being on my wrist. This was worth a lot more than I am. Now, the collectible and secondhand watch market is expected to top $16 billion this year as the auction houses and online marketplaces attract a new breed of younger collectors. Also selling tonight will be Marlon Brando's stainless steel Rolex GMT Master that he wore during the filming of Apocalypse Now. Brando etched his name on the back. It's being sold by his daughter Petra. Proceeds for that also going to charity. Bidding starts for that in the six figures. And you could bid for both of these online so you can sit on your couch and spend millions. I like Wait. Nicholas's watch. It's very classy. Yep. It's yeah. over the school. Cool. So when he says you can bid online, he means you. you. I can. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> sure. All right. Thanks, Robert. Robert, Thank thanks. Uh, coming up, courtroom capitalism. We'll talk to the CEO of a company that makes its money bankrolling lawsuits and what his business can tell us about the economy next on Power Lunch. Be better informed, be better prepared. The Better Network is on TuneIn. This is Brent Musburger. Search B-E-T-R and start hanging out with me and my guys in the desert weekday afternoons. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. To LeBron, slam dunk! The NBA is on TuneIn Premium. Each week, TuneIn picks an NBA game you just can't miss. The Miami Heat are taking their talents to Texas to take on the second-year phenom, Luka Doncic, and the Dallas Mavericks. Back, trying to make it 11 to 2. This Saturday, the Miami Heat are at the Dallas Mavericks. Tip-off is at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Search NBA on TuneIn to follow your favorite NBA team today. The puck drops. 12 players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. Tune in brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on Tune In. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following Tune In on social media. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. Ah, finally another commercial, said no one ever. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade now and get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. 
With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line. It's intercepted. Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can, anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. Again. Search NFL today. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? We got you covered. With TuneIn Premium, you can listen to every NFL game live as it's happening. Sean McCoy has an opening on the right side, punches into the end zone for the touchdown. Or catch it later on demand. Offset backs behind Mahomes. The give is to Williams. Starts right, cuts it back to the left, and blows into the end zone for the touchdown. You call the plays. Follow the NFL anytime, anywhere, all season long with TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Welcome back to Power Lunch. You can call it capitalism in the courtroom. Litigation finance is when a third-party firm provides funding for a lawsuit in exchange for a cut of the potential settlement. Burford Capital is the largest firm of its kind in the world. Its shares are listed in London, ran up 500% in the past five years, but the stock has been sinking this year after Muddy Waters' Carson Block shorted the stock and accused Burford of fraudulent accounting practices Back in August, shares fell in, falling today almost 7% as Block reignites some of those allegations on Twitter. Joining us now is the co-founder and the CEO of Burford Capital, Chris Bogart. For a lot of our viewers, litigation finance might be a new field. So just briefly explain to us how it works. So litigation finance is nothing more complicated than treating litigation claims as financeable assets. You know, you have lots of things, lots of kinds of assets that can be financed, receivables, for example. Litigation is just a special kind of a receivable. When I'm suing you, it's an effort to get money to move from you to me. There's risk and there's contingency associated with that, but fundamentally it's no, uh, no different than me trying to get you money from you in another form. How much does the plaintiff walk away from percentage-wise when a venture capital, when a, when a litigation finance firm comes in? Totally depends on the on the underlying risk of the litigation, as you would expect. These are these are assets that are market priced, just like any other risk based asset. Was well, it fifty five percent? Is it twenty five percent? What you know? Give me a range here. Well, as you probably know, standard U S. contingency fees tend to run in sort of the twenty five to thirty three percent range, sometimes as high as forty percent. Many of our returns, if we're starting a case at the very beginning, are in that similar range. But this is corporate finance. The business that we're doing is large dollar, large corporate activity. And so these are individually negotiated deals with large clients that depend on the risk. So Muddy Waters goes in and they say that it's not that there's so many opportunities and that's not why you're getting such a big run up, but because of the way that you're pricing your assets. Uh, for instance, um, it says Bruford has sold 10% of this particular claim in Argentina called Peterson, 10% of this claim for $40 million in December of 2016. By this year, this summer, 10% of that claim went for $100 million, which implies a value of $1 billion. How do you get on the same case from $400 million to $1 billion valuation? Well, fundamentally, you get a big change in what has happened in the underlying case. And in that particular case, the Supreme Court of the United States came out and agreed with the position that we were taking. And that obviously has an enormous amount of weight and changes the valuation that sophisticated institutional investors are prepared to put on, a, on an asset like that. Why, why is this company saying all these nasty things about you? I don't have a lot of time to, to deal with Carson Block and his new sidekick, Stormy Daniels. You know, I think the reality is he makes his money by coming in very rapidly, running a short attack on a business, and coming out again. He closed a short on Burford months ago, the day he started making all these allegations. And I think we've comprehensively debunked, and our investors agree, um, all of these allegations. What you're seeing now in the shares is some post-attack volatility in both directions, up and down. But what I think you have today is actually a pretty good value opportunity. We, we did 25% EPS growth last year, and you can buy, and, and higher before that, you can buy that level of EPS, EPS growth today at six times trailing PE. That's, that's a pretty good value for long-term growth. But you have said that this Peterson case is, represents a, a large share of your bottom line. And right now you're arguing in U.S. court that it should not be moved to Argentina. You don't think you can get a fair hearing in Argentina for this particular case. It's very risky. So tell investors, if you've got short sellers on your tail, if you've got um, court hearings going on, 
what justifies the risk? What's the return? Well, our business is not about one single case, but it's about a large portfolio of cases. And at any given time, we have any number of large cases that are moving through the courts. Some of them will be terrific successes. Some of them won't make any money. And a large number of them, the majority of them, are going to settle. And that's what litigation is all about. Most litigation settles without going to court. Um, and that's where the middle of the road in litigation finance exists, and that's how we make a good deal of our money. How do you pick the cases that you're going to invest in? So we work together, and our client base tends to be large companies and the large global law firms. We work together with our clients in the law firms to identify opportunities that are both financeable for the underlying client, where a CFO is saying, I would like to take some capital in against this litigation asset that I have today and that isn't doing anything good for me. So we work together with clients and law firms to find cases that both are meritorious and also have sufficient economics that everybody's going to end up happy, the client, the lawyers, and Burford, and its shareholders. All right. Thank you very much for coming in and talking to us. We appreciate that, Chris. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Chris. And Check, Please is next. What I love most about being a scientist at 3M is that I'm... Ah, Christmas. A time for celebrating, unwrapping, and unwinding. Capture every moment with an epic iPhone success with a 12-megapixel camera. Now only $12.99 a month from Tesco Mobile, saving you £72. It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Saving £2 per month over 36 months was £14.99. 36-month credit and rolling monthly usage agreements required. Subject to status, term supply. See tescomobile.com slash terms. In case you didn't know, tune in lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio. Radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. Got a block, hook, into the end zone for the touchdown. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bates. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. Hey, tune in listeners, Steve Kornacki here from NBC News. I want to tell you about a podcast I'm hosting called Article 2, Inside Impeachment. It's dedicated to bringing you the latest developments on the impeachment inquiry into President Trump. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I talk to NBC News reporters who are closest to the story to break down what's new, what matters, and what it means for the 2020 election. Search and favorite Article 2, Inside Impeachment on TuneIn. Want tune in to remind you when the big NFL game is about to get underway? Be sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search NFL on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear under events and tap notify me. We'll let you know exactly when it's time to listen in for kickoff. Ah, finally another commercial, said no one ever. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade now and get over 45 commercial free music stations. The Apple Card will give customers a 6% discount on products bought in the Apple Store. That's a very rare discount on products. And the cardholders can now pay for an iPhone with 24 monthly installments with no interest. So one, do you think that's enough to get people to sign up for this Apple Card? Remember, this is the new product that they're offering alongside Goldman Sachs. I think it, at the margins, it will do well. And I think it has done well since the card has come out earlier this year. I have one. It's very convenient. You can pay it right on the on the phone, and uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that if it gives you a break, why not? Thanks for watching Power Lunch. And closing bell starts now. Welcome to the closing bell. I'm Morgan Brennan in for Sarah Eisen at the AutoZone Post. Take a look at that stock. It's up 7% right now. It's leading the S&P on a strong earnings and sales. Bottom market, meantime, treading water with just 59 minutes left to go in this trading session. And I am Brian Sullivan. Wilfred Frost will be along shortly. Hi, everybody. Let's look at what is driving the action, if you want to call it that. First off, 
You've got the U.S., Mexico, and Canada agreeing to a new trade deal. The USMCA, again, making changes in a bid to win Democratic support in Congress. Stocks really bouncing around all session long on conflicting headlines about that December 15th deadline for China tariffs. Will it be extended? And House Democrats officially announcing the articles of impeachment, two of them against President Trump. Plus, coming up only today on The Closing Bell, Wilfred Frost is live from the Goldman Sachs Financial Services Conference. And he's got an exclusive interview with Oak Park, Oak Woods, Howard Marks in just a few minutes. And later on, Goldman Sachs President John Waldron. All right, joining us now for the hour is Steve Grasso from Stuart Frankel. Steve, we got to stop meeting like this. I know, right. I know. So we talked about this last night on Fast Money 5. What's going to happen if there's no trade deal? What's going to happen if the deal is extended? And what's going to happen if a deal gets done? There are three scenarios. Quickly, walk us through each one. So if the deal gets done, the market shoots higher. But it's only phase one of a deal. So I think it has a lot more still ammo in, the, uh, in, in its ability to move the market progressively higher from there. I, nobody expects a deal to get done anytime soon. You're talking about tariffs going on or not going on or, or, or not coming back on. For me, if they don't get put on, the market rips. If they do get put on, sells off, and it's a buying opportunity. That's it, in a nutshell. You, you have to realize that every, every time this market sells off, the buyers have come in. Who's going to short the market knowing that you not only have one phase, but two phases or three phases of a blow-off top in the overall marketplace? I wouldn't be shorting it. Well, it's also how long are we going to deal with this? I mean, how long have we been talking about this now? Going on two years. Yeah. And now you're talking about phase two and phase three. At some point, the trade war, even the tariffs, if they stick, right. they simply become the new operating normal. You could almost yeah. say that the last when you just said, how long have we been talking about this? You could say this year was less productive than last year on the trade front. But look at the returns in the overall stock market. So if you think about it, a long, short hedge fund is always more long than they are short. So if the market goes down, their longs underperform more than their shorts outperform. Long onlys want the market to go higher. Net, net, there's more people who want to push the market higher mm -hmm. than see it sell off. And that's why it keeps going higher. All right, we're going to talk about this and a whole lot more over the next hour with Steve. In the meantime, let's focus in on the key stories we're watching today. Kayla Tausche has today's big trade headlines. Wilfred Frost is getting the pulse of the banking industry at the Goldman Sachs Financial Services Conference. And Mike Santoli is here with his market dashboard. But Kayla, first to you on trade. Morgan, one of the two major variables on trade getting solved earlier today with House Democrats announcing a deal with the White House on USMCA and negotiators from the U.S., Mexico and Canada in Mexico City to sign and fet the revised deal. The Senate will not vote until after an impeachment trial with some Republicans raising concerns, even as Speaker Pelosi confirms a vote in the House for next week. We're declaring victory for the American worker and what is in this agreement. But we would never, not any one of us, is important enough for us to hold up a trade agreement that is important for American workers uh, because of uh, any uh, collateral benefit that might accrue to any one of us. The White House is aiming to have the USMCA text to the Hill by December 15th, the same day new China tariffs could go into effect. Top economic advisor Larry Kudlow declined to confirm the Wall Street Journal's reporting that tariffs would be delayed, but others have gone further. The Agricultural Secretary Sonny Perdue said at a conference yesterday, we have a deadline coming up on December 15th for another tranche of tariffs. I do not believe those will be implemented, and I do see that we could see some backing away. Officials' reluctance often is because the president changes his mind, which he may yet do in this case. There are bullish signs from officials, but uh, you have to take those with a grain of salt. Brian and Morgan. Kayla, thank you. Uh, the fact that USMCA is finally moving forward here, Kayla, how important to that? How important is that to the U.S.-China trade talks? I ask because if you do start to see some of these deals with American allies and uh, really finally begin to take effect, I can't help but think it only strengthens the U.S.'s hand. Well, there are different scenarios, right, Morgan? I mean, in the USMCA, you had essentially an, an early draft in NAFTA, which they were just trying to revise and modernize. The China deal is starting from scratch, and it's revisiting decades of transgressions that the U.S. says cannot be an equal deal because China has gotten uh, so much of a head start on the U.S. and has so many transgressions that need to be righted here. That being said, the president has suggested 
as recently as a couple months ago that he's willing to bite this off in uh, different portions with a phase one, a phase two, and maybe phase three. The question remains, though, what is in each one of these phases and whether China does in fact sign on? Because even with that announcement in October, China never said there was a deal. It is a big one, and we appreciate you're on top of those headlines. I think I'm the only one, though, that every time you say Kayla says USMC, I ask where's Mike D and Add a Rock because it sounds like the Beastie Boys. <laughs> Kayla Tosh, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Some of Wall Street's biggest names are gathering today for the Goldman Sachs Financial Services Conference right here in New York City. Who other than Wilfred Frost is there with some of the early highlights and a lot more to come? Wilfred. Yeah, Brian, indeed. Uh, here at the Goldman Sachs Financials Conference uh, in New York, as you said. And earlier today, we heard from the J.P. Morgan CFO, Jen Peepsack. Actually, her first presentation since becoming a CFO earlier this year. And uh, she spoke about her optimism about the U.S. economy, particularly the U.S. consumer. Sentiment had come off the peak, but we've now seen a rebound in consumer sentiment. And then on spending, spending very strong. Holiday spend feels very consistent holiday to date with what the trends we've been seeing all year, which is up about 10% year on year. Importantly, though, if you look at Black Friday through Cyber Monday, year over year, we're up nearly 20% for Black Friday through Cyber Monday. Very consistent with what we're seeing broadly across the U.S. consumer, which is very strong. And then on the business side, I would say there are some cautionary signs, um, but things at the margin are improving, or at least have improved since the summer, uh, and that includes CEO sentiment, I would say. The main area of caution, she said there, was commercial uh, real estate. should mention that Wells Fargo and PNC were just as positive uh, on the U.S. consumer city is presenting at the moment. Back to J.P. Morgan and the earnings specifics. They reiterated guidance on net interest income uh, for next year, 58 to 60 billion, despite moves in the yield curve. They also said that investment banking revenue for Q4 should be flat. Previously, people have thought it would be slightly lower, and that trading revenue uh, should be meaningfully higher year over year. All three of those things, slight incremental positives to where expectations were. The stock, therefore, holding on to the gains, huge gains they've seen so far this quarter, flat today, but up 14% since the start of Q4. Guys? Wolf, it's like an early Christmas present for you. I mean, being at a banking conference, getting to really dig into the sector and, and these names even more uh, aggressively today. What have been some of the big trends so far? Yeah, it certainly is. And this conference comes every year this time. It's, it is always an early Christmas present. And, and it's very well attended, <laughs> uh, as you said. And, and tomorrow we've got uh, a couple more interviews uh, from uh, the likes of Brian Minahan, Q Sung Lee, and uh, coming up later on the show, uh, both uh, Howard Marks and John Waldron. In terms of the themes coming out of the conference, though, I've never seen a more stark tone of difference between U.S. consumer and U.S. corporate sentiment. And as you heard just there from the J.P. Morgan CFO, that's not because corporate sentiment has worsened since, say, the summer. If anything, it's fractionally improved or stayed flat. But the U.S. consumer sentiment has improved significantly. Wells Fargo, PNC, J.P. Morgan, all striking that tone. And it's definitely an optimistic one that despite some other challenges, maybe the yield curve or other things, they're able to reiterate their guidance uh, for this quarter and next year. And uh, as we said, uh, the banks have performed very well over the last couple of months, and they're holding that ground today. Yeah, and we know we have some big interviews coming uh, over the next two hours as well. So, Wilf, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Let's send, well. it over see to you Mike Let's send it over to Mike Santoli for today's market dashboard. Mike. Morgan, going to uh, follow Wilf's lead right there with our first uh, installment here. It is a bank run, but the good kind of run in bank stocks. We'll put some numbers on that. And then, uh, is everybody in the pool? That's a question here as we see this sort of risk-on tone uh, to the overall capital markets. Fix it yourself. That's one company in particular showing exactly how it could uh, essentially help its own shareholder returns uh, by acting on its own. And then, alternate futures. A little look at the uh, growth outlook for 2020 by a couple of different uh, means. Uh, a bank run. Take a look at this ratio of the uh, U.S. bank index against the S&P 500. This is the BKX uh, divided by the S&P 500 over two years. What a lot of folks are pointing out here is that you had a pretty solid downtrend line that was broken. So you've had this uh, continuation higher. Now, it has not really been the leadership group in the last couple of weeks, but 
people are basically placing a lot of weight on the fact that this does seem to be a trend reversal. If we went all the way back uh, farther, you've had well, another peak, a decline. So it's been long in coming that we had perhaps a, uh, a return to the fore for the bank stocks. Look at the, look at the valuation right here. These are the universal banks, or the very, very big uh, New York-based uh, banks uh, is mostly measured here. If you look at the price earnings ratio on forward estimates, you've had some escape velocity versus the recent trend in terms of forward PE for this group. A lot of people said they were cheap for years. It, guess what? It's true. And finally, uh, they got some traction. Now, compared to the S&P 500, it is below uh, this longer-term average here uh, for 2019. That's mostly because the overall market has become appreciably more expensive. So the question is, how much higher can that relative multiple go? Well, back in the mid-2000s when the credit boom was going on, these banks were very profitable. Uh, you got up to about 70 or 75 percent of the S&P's multiple. Maybe that's a stretch goal, but as long as the economy holds together, you have to imagine that the bank stocks can probably continue to participate and plug along, guys. All right, Mike, we're going to look forward to more of your dashboard coming up in just a bit. Interesting stuff there on the banks. All right, switching gears. Does this remind you of anything? Shares of Peloton oh backpedaling today, and it has nothing to do. In your face for that. I know, and a little less weight. It has nothing to do with the company's controversial holiday ad. We will explain. And there's a lot more ahead on Closing Bell. After the break, billionaire Howard Marks has a message for investors. I think there are reasons to have less risk going forward than you have had in recent years. Catch Wilfred Frost's full interview, plus an exclusive sit-down with Goldman Sachs President John Waldron, ahead on Closing Bell. This CNBC program is... Are you curious what others are listening to on TuneIn? Head to the trending section under Browse to see the most popular stations and podcasts among TuneIn listeners right now. Check it out. You might just discover something new for yourself. Catch the latest news as it happens with MSNBC on TuneIn. From American politics to global events, when breaking news hits, you'll never miss a moment again. Search MSNBC on TuneIn to hear the latest. Right now, instead of hearing this, you could be listening to the music that keeps you moving with TuneIn Premium. Find today's biggest songs and all of your favorites commercial-free. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? We got you covered. With TuneIn Premium, you can listen to every NFL game live as it's happening. Sean McCoy has an opening on the right side, punches into the end zone for the touchdown. Or catch it later on demand. Offset backs behind Mahomes. The give is to Williams. Starts right, cuts it back to the left, and blows into the end zone for the touchdown. You call the plays. Follow the NFL anytime, anywhere, all season long with TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Introducing a new podcast, ESPN Daily. When you want to go beyond your feed, when you want to get inside the score, when you want to get behind the highlight, there's ESPN Daily. Go deeper into the stories of the moment. Get the exclusive access and insider perspective that only ESPN can give you. ESPN Daily, hosted by me, Mina Kimes. Listen and favorite ESPN Daily on TuneIn. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. Got a block, hook, into the end zone for the touchdown. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. Hockey fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. Here's Petrangelo, he scores! And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. And a move, and a shot, they score! From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. 
45 minutes left to go, and the major averages are hugging the flat line. Here's a check on the markets. As I just mentioned, the Dow is up 11 points. The S&P is just about uh, flat, and the NASDAQ uh, is up fractionally as well. Stitch Fix is trading higher after posting a break-even quarter. With revenue coming in higher than estimates, CEO Katrina Lake spoke on Squawk Alley exclusively this morning. Here's what she said about where the company is investing. We are doing a lot of big investing. I mean, we opened up the UK and kids last year, and so we're annualizing that investment. Those are still investment markets for us, and so we have that. And we're investing a lot in technology and data science, and so we um, have a lot of stock-based compensation. That is um, how you can see the investment that we're making in the team, and that's really against the product, against how do we take Shop Your Looks and make that um, make that fully integrated into our experience, roll it out to everybody. Um, and so there's a lot of investments we're making, but at the same time, we are showing leverage. We're showing great gross margin leverage. Um, we're showing leverage um, in our core business. And so, um, you know, our business has always been one of profitable growth. So that stock has been trading higher today. It's up about 6% right now. Yeah, we talked about it. 47 or 48% of that stock was sold short. Yeah. Steve, yeah. I mean, any sniff of good news, and you're going to light a fire yeah, on it's, it. It's even yeah. airing on, on the upwards of over 50% now. So if you do get a hint of anything good, news, but you know what it makes me think of, though? Lululemon, when they started offering and catering to menswear, they started doubling their audience, right? So now if you have Stitch Fix working out the kids' angle, maybe yeah. it helps them there. International, maybe it helps them there. I thought she was great yep. earlier on the uh, CNBC show. So I'm looking for it to move higher, but it, 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 you can't prolong that move if it's just based on short Heavily coverage. shorted. All right, Steve, we'll come back to you in a bit. All right, here's the big questions of the day. Where is Wilfred Frost and why am I sitting here right now? It's because Wilfred Frost is at a massive Goldman Sachs financial services and banking conference right here in New York City. And given that it is a banking conference, there's a lot of bankers there. Wilfred Frost sat down with a few of them hey, today. Hey. Wilfred. <laughs> I, I, I have done in, uh, indeed, Brian, and thank you for holding the fort uh, in the meantime. But uh, one of the people I just sat down with uh, is uh, Oak Tree's Howard Marks, the uh, famed investor, of course. And I began by asking him whether he was fearful of a market sell-off if we did see a presidential impeachment. Well, number one, impeachment shouldn't come as a surprise. I think it's a foregone conclusion. And number two, given that, if we assume that the market is intelligent, then it shouldn't have an impact. Because if, it is, if it's a foregone conclusion today, mm -hmm. then when it's voted in, in a week or two, uh, and it doesn't come as a surprise if, it, if, if, it, if it's in line with expectations, things that happen in line with expectations should not have a profound impact on the level of the market. But conviction is, is something that you'd be concerned about? I'm not concerned about that because I don't think it'll happen. You know, they need 20 Republican votes to convict in the Senate, mm -hmm. and they don't have one. And I can't imagine what's going to change. In particular, I think that all the evidence is on the table. So how are you going to change 20 minds? Uh, that said, on the political front, uh, the 2020 election, of course, is... Uh only a year or so away, but right. front, front of our minds for sure. Yes. What, what's your take on the impact that might have on, on markets? Well, you know, uh, market-wise, it all depends on whether we have a president who's considered pro or anti-business. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the market took off after uh, Trump's election because he was judged to be pro-market and he has behaved pro-business. Um, it, it, so if he's re-elected, people will continue to uh, see him as pro-business. Uh, they'll breathe a sigh of relief that he was re-elected, and, mm -hmm. and that'll probably be healthy for the market. Uh, in this case, it's not preordained like, like the impeachment. Mm -hmm. I think that, that there is uncertainty as to the outcome. Uh, if he's not elected, then the question is, who is? Uh, uh, Bloomberg would be judged as pro-business. Um, and the market would like that. Biden, moderate, uh, probably not a strong reaction. Warren, who certainly uh, uh, comes out as being anti-business, uh, anti-Wall Street, mm -hmm. uh, I think that, uh, hold your hat. Lee Koopman said 25% sell-off in that sense. Does that equate to hold your hat in, in your mind? Well, look, a week before Donald Trump's election, there were two things we were sure of. Hillary would win, and if Trump won, the market would collapse. So Donald won, and the market went up. And that tells me we don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I, don't, I, try, I try not to make forecasts, and I tend not to believe forecasts, including my own. 
Uh, but I, I do think that that uh, there would be an adverse reaction to a progressive president. When we look at uh, your broader industry, there's been a lot of price pressure and traditional long-only asset management with the, with the growth of indexes, also more recently in, in the broker price wars that we've witnessed. Do you think that kind of price pressure is coming to the credit space, to the private equity space? Um, a lot depends on how it performs. You know, uh, basically, uh, the, people switched from active to passive management in equity funds because active wasn't working and it wasn't earning its high fees. That's why the fees have come down. Uh, I, I, I think we're still in a rational market where things that make money for people will be uh, compensated. Things that don't make money for people will not. When we consider uh, WeWork as, a, as an example of a private market company, yes. private market valuations, do you consider that as broadly actually representing a bubble in private market valuations, or is it more of a, a special situation? No, I think it was a special situation because I think that that valuation of $47 billion earlier this year was made by one, one buyer. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if, if that buyer miscalculated, I don't think that's typical of, of, a, of a broad trend. I think it's very interesting to see that the, you know, the market, one of the roles of the market is to serve as a vigilante and to uh, reject or down price when it should. The, the, the fact that the public market rejected the private market valuation on WeWork, I think was a very healthy development. Uh, and it shows that the market is value sensitive. Uh, that's a plus. Um, I, I know it's very hard to predict when the current cycle yes. will end, but do you ever think about how big the fallout will be this time around when it does end? Do you think that the, the sell-off when it comes will be bigger than 08, 09? Or, or, or well, look, uh, if you've been around 20 years, you may have been around 20 years. I have um, not always investing. You've seen two bubbles, tech and subprime, and two crashes. And you may tend to think, as may your viewers, that that's it, bubbles and crashes. But the truth is we have ups and downs. We have bulls and bears. And they're not all as profound as bubbles and crashes. I don't see that we're in a bubble this time. Uh, certainly nothing comparable to 07. I don't think we're going to have a, uh, a market decline comparable. Uh, things are elevated, but not uh, crazily so. But where we stand today, worth taking a little bit of risk off the table. Well, it, it depends on from what, but I mean, look, everybody's made a lot of money. The economic expansion and the bull market are old. Valuations are above average. Prospective returns are low. There's a lot of uncertainty in the world. And it strikes me that one should not have as much risk as one did three years ago or six years ago. Uh, you've made a lot of money. Take some off the table. Uh, that is not the, to say it's going down. You know, if I thought it was going down, which I don't know how I would reach that conclusion, mm -hmm. uh, I would say sell it all. But I, I never say that, and you, it's impossible to say that. But I think there are reasons to have less risk going forward than you have had in recent years. So taking a little bit less risk uh, today perhaps than in recent years, though uh, all things considered, relative to the last three or four investor letters he sent out, uh, I actually thought he was a little more constructive than perhaps he could have been. His comments on WeWork, perhaps an indication of that, which I thought also was pretty interesting. Still to come from that interviewer, his comments uh, on the Fed, on interest rates, and what that does to market multiples. And then coming up uh, at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time, John Waldron, the Goldman Sachs president and CEO, of course, will be discussing some of the themes from today's conference here at Goldman Sachs, uh, but also plenty to discuss on the Goldman front uh, from their upcoming all-important January strategy update that they're due to give. Maybe an update on 1MDB. There's been some movement uh, on that front, it seems, according to reports. Uh, and the Apple Card latest, that uh, announcement from Apple today about free financing uh, for an iPhone, but as well as those questions over potential gender bias. Uh, it'd be great to get his uh, points on that uh, on the record. Guys, I'll send it back to you. Well, great stuff. We're looking forward to more of it, too, throughout the hour. Thank you. Steve, the comments about if President Trump wins the next election. I mean, there's been so much focus on this idea of what happens if somebody like 
and Elizabeth Warren wins the election. Right. I mean, I, th I think back to 2016 uh, when the talk was, if Trump wins, the market's going to tank. And it right. did for a couple hours overnight. And then right. everything changed again. But if you, think of, if you think about why the market moved substantially higher, it was on tax cuts <laughs> yep. and deregulation. So obviously the antithesis of Trump is, is Warren. And the rest of the field is still going to be worse when it comes to taxes but and regulations. I, got, I know we got tight and tight. I got to jump in on that, though. I've talked to a lot of people that are worried about this, this trading tax idea from Warren because if you, if you start to tax every trade, you're going to push the high-speed guys out of the market. Now, you may not care or feel sorry for the billionaire high-speed traders. Nobody does but them. But they are a massive part of the underlying framework of the market. And everybody I've talked to is worried if that is removed or reduced, they just don't know what the baseline is going to be. Yeah, you have no idea where the, the bids, the offers, what the substantive market players will be on a day-to-day -day basis. But I keep it simple. It's about taxes. It's about deregulation. And no matter how you slice it, if both of those get pulled off the table, even incrementally, and Warren, it's not going to be incremental. Yeah. Then you're giving up a large portion of these gains and then some. All right, up next, Netflix scoring a 34 Golden Globe nominations, but one firm says the company is facing a big hurdle on the horizon, and that is sending its shares lower. We're going to get the word on the street on that call next. Yeah, and later on, something very cool, an inside look at the SEC's highly secured forensics lab. You're also going to hear from SEC Chairman Jay Clayton about the high-tech tools that they are using to crack cases. We're back after this. Upgrade to TuneIn Premium and get over 45 commercial-free music stations. You'll also get live commercial-free news, plus live play-by-play -play games from NFL, MLB, NBA, and NHL. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. Some days life can get in the way of catching up on the news that moves your world. <laughs> TuneIn is here to help. With live 24-7 coverage from CNN wherever you go on the TuneIn app, you can always find a slice of your schedule, however long, to check in on the biggest stories of the day. Hell hath no fury. The president's counselor went on a rampage on a taped phone call with Washington Examiner reporter. Search CNN on TuneIn to get the live news when it matters most. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? we got you covered. With TuneIn Premium, you can listen to every NFL game live as it's happening. LaShawn McCoy has an opening on the right side, punches into the end zone for the touchdown. Or catch it later on demand. Offset backs behind Mahomes. The give is to Williams. Starts right, cuts it back to the left, and blows into the end zone for the touchdown. You call the plays. Follow the NFL anytime, anywhere, all season long with TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. The puck drops. Twelve players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. Tune in brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on Tune In. Far wing elevates triple bucket. The war of the crowd. The shot clock ticks down. Will the ball go in? The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. And the replays just don't cut. To the sideline, the man fleet for three. TuneIn Premium brings you every minute of the NBA season streaming live, so you can be there when it matters most. Hear it now, hear it live on TuneIn. I'm faking the lane, turnaround jumper from eight feet is good on Search the right NBA block. today to start listening. Smart Sports Wagering Talk is now on TuneIn. This is Brett Musburger. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. Search B-E-T-R. Be better informed. Be better prepared. And remember, cash and tickets is what it's all about. Like what you're listening to? Want to make getting back to it easier? Use the favorite button to keep track of the stations and podcasts you love on TuneIn. Just tap or click the heart icon to add it to your favorites. Then find all your go-to audio under the favorites tab. Pretty easy, right? Welcome back to Closing Bell. It is time now to get to the word on the street. Oppenheimer raising its price target on Peloton to $38 a share from $29. The firm points to Peloton's search trends, website traffic, and improving customer satisfaction metrics. Meanwhile, though, Citron Research also out with a note on Peloton saying investors are, quote, peddling themselves into a frenzy, giving the stock a $5 price target for 2020. Peloton stock is currently trading down. 
quite a bit today, another 6.5%, yeah. around $32 and change per share. By, by the way, the average price target of the 20 analysts that cover Peloton is $33. So right you got an extreme call here, a very extreme call on the downside. In the meantime, we're sitting right in the middle. All right. Maybe the big call of the day is this one, Needham downgrading Netflix to underperform. Fancy word for sell. Analyst Laura Martin says Netflix is going to be hurting, losing as many as 4 million subscribers in 2020. Needham suggests that Netflix may need to add a second lower price service to compete with the likes of Disney+, Plus, Apple+, Plus, Hulu, and others. By the way, Laura will join us later at 4 p.m. Great analyst made a call, originally downgraded the stock earlier this year. Fantastic call, another downgrade, so look forward to that. Interview. Yeah, absolutely. I Steve. think the, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Steve, your your reaction to either one of these names right now. So I think the Needham call, I, I like that lower tier uh, monthly subscription. I think that makes a ton of sense to get people back in, to get them sort of moving up and be full, uh, full Netflix subscribers. On the Peloton side, they're at risk of being just a hardware company. It reminds me of GoPro. Right? I mean, you can't ride a GoPro. Which but you think was part of Citron's you're, you're, argument you're, as well. Yeah, yeah. Wait, exactly. But I do like that the traffic has been increasing at an exponential pace on the websites, on the digital membership. So I think they have a shot here. And you talk about the price targets. Still above its IPO price of $29. So that's crucial for me that it holds that level. Well, well by the way, there are imitators. A company called Echelon, the website, the, the logo kind of looks the same. The bike kind of looks the same. And they're advertising a lower price point. So yeah, Peloton key, may not have had enough protection spend. on the IP side. I mean, I, if you look at this. I can't understand how that's even possible. But I guess people yeah. can push stuff yeah. through through court systems and everything else. But the bike, yes, is too expensive. The treadmills are too expensive. But we'll see what happens in the long run. All right. We've got less than 30 minutes to go here. Here are the three things that are driving the action. First, the U.S., Mexico, and China agreed. China, excuse me. Canada agreed to revise. We need that revise. deal. We need the China deal. You just broke news. Oh my Morgan God, there's Brennan. so many China, China deals to and talk Mexico about. have entered yes. into a long term The merger. U.S., Mexico, and Canada agreed to a revised USMCA oh. trade deal, making changes in a bid to win Democratic support in Congress. Stocks have bounced around all session on conflicting headlines about the December 15th deadline for Chinese tariffs. <laughs> And House Democrats officially announced articles of impeachment against President Trump. It is time now for a CBC News update, though. Sue Herrera. Hey, Sue. Hello, Morgan. Hello, everyone. Here's what's happening at this hour. A very fluid and still developing situation. One officer is dead. Two others have been shot. And uh, this is all taking place amid an active shooter situation in a store in Jersey City, New Jersey. All the public schools in the city have been locked down as multiple SWAT teams respond. Dozens and dozens of gunshots were fired. Two gunmen are down. We don't know their condition. Police are sending in a robot to assess that situation. The Florida Keys Sanctuary is getting a $100 million facelift. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration announcing a new restoration plan designed to restore seven iconic coral reef sites off the Florida Keys. That is the size of 52 we have football fields. We have identified some iconic reefs here in the Keys that we want to help restore. These reefs have been suffering from a number of threats for years, as have reefs all around the world. And Redbox is getting out of the video game business. The company is saying it will fo focus exclusively on movies. Redbox says game rentals are no longer available from its kiosks, but customers can still buy games until early next year. We're going to continue to follow that developing story in Jersey City, New Jersey. In the meantime, you're up to date. Brian, I'll send it back downtown to you. That is terrifying stuff here. It is. Uh, just across the river. All right, thank you very much, Sue Herrera. Keep us updated. Meantime, House Democrats announcing articles of impeachment, two of them, against President Trump. Let's get now to Elon Moy in Washington with the very latest. Elon. Brian, the next step is for the House Judiciary Committee to debate these two articles of impeachment, abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. And we are expecting that a committee vote could happen on Thursday, which would set up a vote before the full House early next week. We do not take this action lightly, but we have taken an oath to defend the Constitution. And unlike President Trump, we understand that our duty first and foremost is to protect the Constitution and to protect the interests of the American people. That is why we must take this solemn step today. 
Well, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said today that he does not see his chamber getting to a trial until after the Christmas break, and it's still unclear what that trial will look like, how long it might last, and whether the Senate will call its own witnesses. McConnell told reporters this afternoon that no decisions have been made yet. But guys, it is worth noting that the Senate's official calendar has left January wide open. Back over to you. Elon Moy, thanks for bringing us the latest. Still to come, we'll head back out to the Goldman Sachs conference for an exclusive can't-miss interview with Goldman President John Waldron. And as we head to break, let's get a check on bonds. U.S. Treasury yields getting a small bump. Investors, they are awaiting that Fed's decision, even though apparently every single one of them expects the Fed to hold steady. The benchmark tenure at 1.83 percent. We're back after this. The Bond Report is... Today, your information is more exposed than ever. When you shop, sign in, or browse, you could be vulnerable to cyber criminals. More online threats demand more protection. That's why new Norton 360 provides multiple layers of protection, combining device security, secure VPN, password manager, and cloud backup all in one solution. Get new Norton 360, starting at $24.99 for the first year. On three, our unlimited data is actually unlimited, like four reels. None of this, we're so unlimited, but nah, uh you can't watch your fave Christmas film endlessly. Or dead scroll inspo for tree decorations until 4 in the morning. We wouldn't do that to you. We have no speed limits, no data caps, and you'll be 5G ready at no extra cost. Ho, ho, ho. Switch to 3, in-store or online. See 3.co.uk forward slash unlimited dash data. This week at Tesco, buy two items from our chilled party food range, like tempura prawns or mozzarella sticks, and get a third one free. So for every two people you invite, you can ask another for free. But who? Linda from Accounts or Julio from Magaluf 2010. Tesco, delivering Christmas for 100 years. Cheapest item free selected stores while stocks last ends 1st of January. The swagger of a perfect dunk. The rush of a three made from all the way downtown. The adrenaline surge of great defense. Can you feel the goosebumps yet? There's nothing like live NBA and nothing like listening live on TuneIn. Giannis down the lane, the rim, it. Right corner three, another TuneIn one. Premium brings you every minute of the NBA season so you can be there when it matters most. Never miss the action as it happens. Hear the ball you love. Hear it live on TuneIn. Search NBA today to start listening. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. Want TuneIn to remind you when the big NFL game is about to get underway? Be sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search NFL on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear under events and tap Notify Me. We'll let you know exactly when it's time to listen in for kickoff. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. All right, about 22 minutes left. we got a little move in the market down. We're down about 34 on the Dow. Not a lot, but you consider the fact that we were basically literally at one point unchanged, flatline. Last few minutes, starting to see some action. Just something to keep an eye on. All right, let's send it over now to Michael Santoli for the second installment of his market dashboard. Mike, what are you looking at now? Right, thanks very much. Asking if uh, everyone has kind of already gotten in the pool on this rally. Maybe that's why it's cooling off a little bit. Take a look at the trend in the S&P 500. Uh, this just goes back a year, so it kind of shows you that uh, decline last December and then the big uh, recovery. Here's what a lot of folks are focused on, which is the fact that this rally kind of stalled out basically at this top end of this particular trend. If you really look at the market as, you know, as, as setting up these patterns and traveling in these trend channels, uh, it's obviously kind of bumped up against the top, and now it's stalling out, perhaps has to kind of, uh, you know, cool off some sentiment uh, and refresh the buying power. You know, sometimes these patterns, it's like looking at the sky and seeing puppies and bunnies, but this seems to really, this year, obey uh, this trend line. So we'll see if that's really just the backing off. Now, risk sentiment seems okay. Look at the dollar. Uh, in the last couple of months in particular, it has rolled over a bit, come off the boil. That's consistent with kind of a, um, 
you know, sort of a reflationary story, the global macro picture picking up a little bit less risk off. And then the uh, obverse of this could be copper. Uh, copper prices have been breaking out in the short term lately, not breaking out to an all-time high, but right around the same time the dollar uh, faded, you started to see that rebound as well. Of course, could be sentiment firming up on a trade deal and China demand and all the rest of it. So the, the, the internals of the market still seem like they're, they're getting traction in terms of a cyclical uh, beneficial move. But right now, the overall index seems like it's just a little bit stuck or maybe fatigued for the moment, guys. All right, Mike, thank you. Steve, looking at this chart and, and listening to the comments from Mike right now, this idea that a potential reigniting of a reflation trade, is this all anticipated into an, in anticipation of trade, a trade deal with China, or is it more a signal that perhaps we have some sort of bottom in terms of global economic or growth? Moving the dollar. Yes. Or moving dollar. Or a dollar. So, so I think they, the, the move Dollar. I think you have to go back to the Fed and when the Fed starts playing around with the balance sheet, when they were tightening, then we saw the dollar move higher and they, they had stopped cutting rates. But now we're starting to see QE, the extension of QE. And if they're going to if they're going to ex expand that balance sheet, then we can start to see a lot of these moves get coupled with the trade headlines. And I think that results in what Mike is pointing out with those charts. All right. Up next, we've got your last chance to trade and Grasso is picking a name that's already up. 150% this year. What? Find out why he says it's still a buy. That's coming up. Upgrade to TuneIn Premium and get over 45 commercial-free music stations. You'll also get live commercial-free news, plus live play-by-play -play games from NFL, MLB, NBA, and NHL. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. Fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. Here's Petrangelo, he scores! And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. In a move, and a shot, and From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and a... call for every game for every team live at home or on the go never miss a game with the nhl on TuneIn premium upgrade great today to lebron slam The NBA is on TuneIn Premium. Each week, TuneIn picks an NBA game you just can't miss. The Miami Heat are taking their talents to Texas to take on the second-year phenom, Luka Doncic, and the Dallas Mavericks. Pulls back, trying to make it 11-2. to This Saturday, the Miami Heat are at the Dallas Mavericks. Tip-off is at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Search NBA on TuneIn. Follow your favorite NBA team today. Hey, tune in listeners, Steve Kornacki here from NBC News. I want to tell you about a podcast I'm hosting called Article 2, Inside Impeachment. It's dedicated to bringing you the latest developments on the impeachment inquiry into President Trump. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I talk to NBC News reporters who are closest to the story to break down what's new, what matters, and what it means for the 2020 election. Search and favorite Article 2, Inside Impeachment on TuneIn. In the stock market and in life, everything can change from one minute to the next. Be the first to hear the latest money news and market trends with CNBC on TuneIn. Wherever your day takes you, listen to CNBC's full slate of programming, including shows like Fast Money, Squawk Box, and Mad Money with Jim Cramer. And when the next big business story breaks, CNBC lets you know with live updates and commentary at the office, at home, or on the go. 
Search CNBC on TuneIn to listen. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line. It's intercepted. Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can, anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. Again. Search NFL today. Sixteen minutes left to go. Major averages are slightly lower. Steve, what is your last chance trade? Snap. Talked no about way. this. I've talked about this a lot. It's up 153 percent year to date. You're going. It's natural to get some sell side with a stock that's up that much going into year end. People want to lock in some profits. Maybe they have some losses to write off against it or whatnot. There's filters. There's international growth. There's also the seventeen dollar IPO price that this thing is going to be a magnet to get back to in 2020. You've chosen it's a twenty percent move. I think you chose it back in October as well. Stock's yeah. down about three percent since then, and you're well, basically it, saying this is profit taking. So, so this this is profit taking. But why don't we look backwards and say, okay, when I picked it, it traded higher from there. I never said okay. to hold it until the next time I was going to be on closing bell talking about Snapchat. All right. Right. I mean, how how much did it go up from there? Fifteen percent from the time I picked it. Twenty percent. I got to check. Whatever the number is. All right. So you should have been aware of that. Oh snap. <laughs> a snappy call. Steve, thanks for joining us. Thank you. We appreciate that. We'll see you next time. I'll probably see you tomorrow night. It's true. On Fast Money 5. (laughs) 5 5 p.m. Eastern. That's the name. (laughs) All right, up next, uninterrupted coverage of the final minutes of trading. We're going to take you inside the market zone when closing bell returns. Hey, tune in listeners, Steve Kornacki here from NBC News. I want to tell you about a podcast I'm hosting called Article 2, Inside Impeachment. It's dedicated to bringing you the latest developments on the impeachment inquiry into President Trump. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I talk to NBC News reporters who are closest to the story to break down what's new, what matters, and what it means for the 2020 election. Search and favorite Article 2, Inside Impeachment on TuneIn. fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. And tucks it home! And with this team, it's it's really fun to be a part of a team like that. And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. Pascal gobbles up the rebound and slams it down. Catch your favorite NBA team right here on TuneIn. A step back, D3 is up and in. Search NBA on TuneIn and hear all the action. The NBA lives on TuneIn. Upgrade to TuneIn Premium and get over 45 commercial-free music stations. You'll also get live commercial-free news, plus live play-by-play games from NFL, MLB, NBA, and NHL. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. Hey, NFL fan. Can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught, it is in for the right side for the touchdown. Again. Search NFL today. Some days life can get in the way of catching up on the news that moves your world. Tune in is here to help with live 24 7 coverage from CNN wherever you go on the TuneIn app. You can always find a slice of your schedule, however long, to check in on the biggest stories of the day. Hell hath no fury. The president's counselor went on a rampage on a taped phone call with Washington Examiner reporter. Search CNN on TuneIn to get the live news when it matters most. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. This is Brian Musburger. Search the Better Network. 
That's the BETR Network. And then let us get you better prepared to better enjoy the day in sports. The NFL, college football, basketball, hockey, baseball, sharpen your edge. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. Be better informed. Be better prepared. Search the Better Network. That's B E T R. Less than 12 minutes left in the trading day. Both the Dow and the SP are lower right now. We are now in the closing bell market zone. Commercial free coverage of all the action going into a close. And CBC senior markets commentator Michael Santoli here now to break down some of the crucial moments of this trading day. And today we've also got Barbara Duran from BD8 Capital Partners is here. Barbara, welcome. Thanks Thank for you. joining us. Yeah, yeah, okay, so you look at this market, you look at this tape, Mike, and you think, all right, we might end flat. Nothing happened. Yeah. But inside the grease, the wheels, the gears, they're always turning. What stuck out to you? Uh, honestly, the market is just kind of holding its own right below the highs. Um, you know, Apple up a little bit today, hovering less than half a percent from its high. So I honestly think the market is looking to uh, wait until this known catalyst to trade is out of the way. And uh, we're waiting and seeing. It's it's sort of also figuring out if last week's little 2 to 3% pullback was enough. Uh, that remains to be seen. All right. So we got a lot to cover. Let's kick things off with what should have been a headline that moved markets maybe positively, and that is trade. Because House Democrats and Republicans reaching a deal to move forward with the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement, the USMCA. That is a replacement of the 1994 NAFTA deal. The revised agreement includes tools to settle labor and environmental disputes. The move comes on the heels of a Wall Street Journal report saying the U.S. and China were planning for a possible delay in the implementation of those next round of tariffs set to go on December 15th. However, White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow dismissed that report at a Wall Street Journal conference, saying tariffs were still on the table. So the paper says, we may delay. Kudlow at the paper's conference says, there will be no delay. Barbara Duran, all you're trying to do is make money for your clients. How do you manage this every day? I know. Well, every day you don't. I mean, you don't, not changing any asset allocations, not changing my stock picks. And you're trying to see, well, is the market really, you know, overstretched here or not? And the fact is, I think that your trade is clearly driving it a little bit in the short term. But I'm beginning to think that it's really about the Fed cuts this year, those three interest rate cuts, you know, that are really being discounted in the market in terms of future earnings and also multiple valuation support. So I think that's a big part of what's actually going on. And yes, trade's an issue. If we suddenly slap on more tariffs, then everybody's going to, you know, the market will go down until it sorts out. How meaningful is this? So, but I, I think it's uh, it's really about the Fed cuts. All right, it's a key point. Meantime, Boeing out with new delivery numbers. Let's get a fill of both. Hey, Phil. Morgan, a little bit of good news for Boeing in the November delivery number or orders numbers, I should point out, because the 737 MAX really, for most of the year, they've had no substantial orders. And a few here and a few there, but nothing substantial. Well, in November, they had 30 planes that were the result of two firm orders. Overall, for November, commercial airplanes was a net positive of 11 planes for Boeing, but still for the year, they're at negative 84. Check out this chart. Right now, Boeing is on pace to have its fewest deliveries since since 2008. 2008. And that's when there was a machinist strike, which was the reason that they didn't deliver a number of 737s that year. Right now, they have 345 airplanes delivered. Guys, you do not want to miss our exclusive interview tomorrow morning. Steve Dixon, head of the FAA, we will be talking with him exclusively at 8 o'clock, right before he goes over and testifies on Capitol Hill about how the FAA has been handling the MAX. Again, guys, a lot of the questions here will center around whether or not Boeing's expectation of having this plane recertified and the grounding lifted by the end of the year, whether or not that'll happen. We'll be talking with the FAA administrator about that. What's your best expectation of what he's going to say, Phil? I think he says we go on our time frame. We don't go on Boeing's time frame. Boeing may still be hanging on to that, but he's not going to change where they're at. All right, Phil LeBeau, we look forward to that as well. Thanks for bringing us that. Okay, we're closing in about a little over five minutes left to go. Apple making two announcements about its Apple Card today. What are those? Let's find out. Josh Lipton is here. Josh. 
So, Brian, starting today, people who have the Apple Card can buy an iPhone and pay for it over 24 months with zero interest. So the question for investors, does this new feature, this new program, now help encourage more iPhone upgrades in the quarters ahead? And if so, how much? Apple also announced a new holiday promotion. Apple Card customers can get 6% cash back on purchases of Apple products from now until the end of the year, December 31st. Normally, remember, Apple Card customers get 3% cash back, and that could certainly help drive adoption of the new Apple Card in this critical holiday shopping season. Guys, back to you. All right, Josh, thank you very much. Coming up, Goldman Sachs president and COO John Waldron will weigh in on the Apple Card. They're their partner, after all. They'll speak exclusively to Wilfred Frost coming up a bit later on in the show. That interview, what I guess, you, what do they say? What do we say? You cannot afford to miss it. No, can't afford to miss it. Meantime, Mike Santoli, Apple, up 70% yeah. year to date. Far and away, the best performing Dow stock. Yes. Um, obviously, it, it checks off a lot of the boxes. There's what this market has wanted, not just technology, but just this kind of quality balance sheet, the buybacks, the long-term growth story is all intact. I do think this measure is very interesting, both to promote the adoption of the card, but also they've wanted to smooth out the upgrade cycle for a long time. The installment buying plan that's been in place for a while, I think, went some distance. You know, you ever think that. we talk about Boeing, the, he the highest price stocks or the heaviest weighted in the price yeah. weighted index, and I know pros don't look at the Dow, but it shows up on the cover of, you know, sort of sure. newspapers and general news. Mm -hmm. If Boeing had, had not had these problems and just performed with the average of the other stocks, the Dow could be a lot higher than it is now. Yeah. Yeah, it, it would be, uh, I mean, let's say it was 50 bucks higher, or 50 bucks higher is another, you know, 350 points on the Dow. So you'd be handily over 28,000 right now. Ride-sharing companies Uber and Lyft both trading below their IPO prices as investors have become increasingly concerned with both companies' paths to profitability. Former Twitter COO Adam Bain joined CNBC's halftime report earlier and weighed in. I think the issue with, with Uber and Lyft ultimately is a bit of this, um, you're trading on someone else's capital for a bit. Uh, Uber and Lyft essentially have massive stipends and uh, bonuses that they pay um, drivers and, and uh, drive the incentive wheel in that way. If they take that away, ultimately both of those companies will be, pro will be highly profitable. It's just a question now of who moves first. You know, it's incredible, Barbara, because we have heard these companies and some of the others that uh, have been growth at all costs and, and maybe no signs of profitability, at least in the next couple of years, come out and at least say, oh, adjusted EBITDA positive, you know, 2021 or 2022, whichever, you know, whatever company we're talking about. But I think it sort of marks a shift in the market, particularly among public investors this year, more discerning about, about the metrics and what they're looking for. I think that's right. And I think that's, you know, what the shift has been and why you're starting to hear the managements of Uber and Lyft, and particularly Uber, saying we've got to focus more on that. You know, they've talked about Uber Eats. They're willing to rationalize because they, it's really about the investors and the stock price. So I think they've got a couple levers to pull, and I think they've got a growth plan, and maybe they have to move it up a little sooner. It can be, you know, cutting <clears throat> cutting down what they pay the drivers, or it can be raising yeah. prices. I mean, that study that you all did this morning, you know, you know a survey. You know, Mike, Scott Walker did a great show from San Francisco today, and one of the guests, I don't know who was, I was listening on the radio, said companies are no longer going to be given a pass based on if this happens, right. then we'll be okay. Because the markets have stopped now with WeWork and Uber saying, well, what if that doesn't right. happen? You need a path that's persuasive to your second and act. Cle and clear yeah. to what's happening now in that's the right. moment. Yeah, yeah it's not we're going to figure out later once we get scale. That's no longer really uh, a welcome answer. All right, Mike has more on the market internals today. Mike. Yeah, oh, absolutely. The uh, been pretty much break even. You're looking up and down stocks on the New York Stock Exchange. Actually, slightly positive for most of the day, even while the uh, the index is a bit about flat. So you see it's turned slightly negative, pretty much in tune with what the indexes are doing. Didn't want to highlight uh, oil sneakily kind of getting up to the top of its recent range. And actually, if you look at the chart of WTI, it's uh, it's got a nice yeah. little mini uptrend right here. 60 is capped it for a while with the, with the exception of that one little spike. What's amazing this year, oil is up 30%. Yeah. The XOP oil ETF is down the stocks 20%. Don't want to hear it. The exactly. stocks stink because yeah. of debt and socially conscious investing, yeah. but oil keeps going you up. You do wonder if there's a threshold price that maybe that changes, but that remains to be seen. Yeah. we got two minutes left to go here. Let's head over to Rick Santelli for a check on bonds. Hey, Rick. 
You know, productivity for the third quarter final was the first negative quarter since the end of 2015, but we have brighter news on the zoo business confidence in Germany, at least the expectations. But the big story, obviously, was trade, and it made everything go up early. Two-year note yields, you see there, still up four basis points, actually at the high yield of the day. October 30th, last Fed meeting, you see 10-year note yields there. They've drifted, but they're still higher than they were at that meeting. Finally, six out of seven down days in the dollar index, as you see there. And Bertha at the NASDAQ, not a good last hour again. Yeah, we're just sort of fading down, but biotech continues to be the relative outperformer, and among the big gainers today is Bluebird Bio. We continue to hear some strong trial data, in this case for a gene, uh, CAR-T gene therapy drug for cancer with Bristol-Myers. Meantime, uh, Norton uh, LifeLock today, uh, trading higher on big volume, hitting a new 52-week high on a Wall Street Journal report that it may be looking to do a merger, perhaps, with McAfee. Finally, MongoDP beat on earnings, had pretty good outlook, but the stock has faded here into the close. Over to Seema. Confluence of headlines on trade dominated the discussion on the market floor today. We were, uh, we are off the lows of the session. The Dow was lower by 105 points at the open. We're currently down about 26. Take a look at industrial giant 3M at the bottom of the Dow once again. This is, of course, one of those names that is sensitive to trade headlines. And as we see the sustained move in oil prices, check out the move in transport stocks. Transports once again weak. Names like American Airlines, United Air down 2 to 3 percent. J.B. Hunt, a rail And I'm Morgan Brennan, in for Sarah Eisen, along with Mike Santoli, CNBC Senior Markets Commentator. Wilfred Frost is at the Goldman Sachs Financial Services Conference in New York. He'll join us in just a little bit with an exclusive interview with Goldman President and COO John Waldron. All right, in the meantime, let's take a look at how we finished the day on Wall Street. You're going to look at this market and go, not a lot happened. Well, first off, let's celebrate the small caps getting a little. They're all grown up, as Vince Vaughn <laughs> said in Swingers. Russell 2000 continuing its path higher, up another tenth of a percent. Yeah, only two points, but small caps, they've been on the run. The Dow S&P and NASDAQ down just a touch. We were unchanged most of the day. We got a trade deal. The market didn't respond. We got impeachment articles drafted. The market didn't respond. That alone is interesting, Morgan. It absolutely is. Energy, healthcare, and tech stocks, those are the three sectors that ended the day in the green. Joining us to talk about the market day overall is Young, Director of Market Strategy at BNY Mellon Investment Management. And Barbara Duran, a CIO and Senior Portfolio Manager at BD8 Capital Partners, is still with us. But Mike Santoli, first to you. We saw we were up, we were down, but really very narrow trading range in yeah, general. Yeah, narrow range for a couple days. Market's kind of just idling. Now, we're, we're sort of just holding a little bit above uh, where we finished last Thursday, right? And get the good jobs report. Seems to ratify what this market has been trying to say, which is uh, we've probably seen the, the low in growth rates for a while. But I think we just got up to a level on the S&P, uh, hit that 3150 as a high. We're craving, investors are craving uh, some reassurance that, in fact, this December 15th tariff deadline doesn't happen. I don't think it's going to drive the next phase of this market, but it needs to get out of the way. So what could? Let's talk about what you just talked about, Mike, which is oil. If energy One stocks can, I know they're tiny, I yeah. get it, but if they can start to participate even a little, would that help? It wouldn't hurt. Uh, I don't think you want to hang a lot on it. Uh, it would be part of this general kind of value reflation trade that might uh, fit in with other things going on. But um, it's a nice to have. It's not it's a catch up to the market's Let's fries. Let's be honest. This is not the same without that. Yeah. Liz, the fact that trade has been once again dominating headlines and market moves today, what is priced into this market? I think what was priced into the market, which is indicative of what's happened already today, is that we were going to have a rollback of the December 15th tariffs. We were going to maybe take the September tariffs off. I think the conversation moving forward, if we get an actual deal, that would be a positive for the market, even though everybody is sort of expecting that. Having a deal would be a positive. Even a scrawny little phase one Even a thing. scrawny deal. Because let's face it, we haven't had a deal at all, really. It's only been about tariffs. Are tariffs going on? Are tariffs coming off? Are we raising them? Are we lowering them? The conversation will continue to be about tariffs, but if we actually get a deal, signed, sealed, delivered, then the market moves up. 
We're talking about the China trade deal right now. There's also the USMCA deal that we got some developments on today, too. USA MCA? USMCA. The new NAFTA. The new yeah. NAFTA oh, the deal. New NAFTA. God, I'm so used to it. Is that NAFTA. something that would move stocks? If we actually no. seen that finally signed into law. I know, but you know, it wasn't really visible. It hasn't been an, it hasn't been a big factor in our exports, their export. There hasn't been this continual battle of words. So I really think yes, it's great. It, you know, there was not much uh, talk about it, but I think China remains the focus. And I agree with Liz. If I think that if we got even one phase one done, I think it has ramifications beyond that. That we'll think positive, maybe we'll get more. So It might be a phase one and done because we might be all be retired by the yeah. time this whole thing is done. <laughs> Alright, Barclays out with an optimistic 2020 outlook for the small caps. The firm giving a 1780 year end price target on the Russell 2000. That's about 9% above current levels, saying that an accommodative Fed, a reduction in the trade war risks, and a reasonably healthy domestic U.S. growth environment will all help drive the group higher. It also recommended an overweight rating in industrials, consumer discretionary software and healthcare sectors. It's about half the sectors there. Liz, we saw, you know, listen, a tiny move, but small caps, the only group that did well today. Are you a believer and a buyer? in the smaller, more domestic companies? I am, and I like the bullish tilt. Uh, I mean, I used to be a small cap analyst, so I have a little bit of a soft spot in my heart for them. Didn't even but know that. Uh, I think you have to look at, too, why did small caps lag large caps this year? They lagged because there was not as much of an appetite for beta. And in that environment, small caps are not going to see as much demand next year if we have what I'm calling a psychological recovery. The recession that we've all been waiting for never happened. So now market participants are deciding, okay, maybe it's not coming. It's time to actually take part in this. Now, they missed a little bit this year, but if we get that back on the table next year, I think you see that pickup in beta stock. Small cap is one of the big beneficiaries of that. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's, it's all very plausible. The numbers point that way. The valuations have come more into line on the small caps. I just don't think it's an either-or trade because it really it's more a matter of uh, can small caps kind of keep pace and participate in an ongoing rally. The times when it's kind of small caps are all that works, that's kind of in your correction bear market phase uh, when all of a sudden finally it gets washed out and you get value. So I'm not saying, I don't think that's what people are really projecting or necessarily hoping for. Yeah, I don't see small caps outperforming large caps. I mean, the rationale has been, yes, we're over the recession fears if we have some sort of agreement with China, but it's not going to be just not raising tariffs. I think we have to have a huge rollback to see an impact in the small caps. So I think, you know, small caps have had a nice rally this year, but they've still underperformed large cap, and I think that underperformance will continue, but I think they'll go in line. All right, Oak Tree Capital co-chairman Howard Marks sitting down with our own Wilfred Frost earlier today. Here's what he had to say about the Fed's recent moves and their impact on the market. I don't think it's appropriate that every 25 basis point cut in rates should be expected to <laughs> goose the, 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 uh, you know, the market by 1,000 points. But, you know, things are still continuing up. The market is still in an uptrend, and, uh, and people like the low rates. Barbara, this kind of goes right back to the point you were making just a few moments ago. Yeah, no, and it's interesting because Howard's remarks were, he thought, gee, you don't have a thousand points on a quarter, you know, 25 bips cut. But really at that point in time, you remember we had the recession fears and global slowing and what was that going to mean? And after, I think it's been pretty well agreed that the Fed tightened just a little too much in 18 and we had the lag effect this year. So the fact that the Fed was ready to cut rates and they made all positive noises about possibly more, I think the market said, this is exciting. This is time, you know, to, to get involved. Yeah, I... What I would pay attention to, though, is it all depends on what's priced into the market ahead of the cut. And that cut in July, there was a 100% chance of them cutting, according to the market. Same thing happened in September. Close thing happened in October. So I, I don't think we should expect a huge bump every time they cut rates, especially if it's already baked now, According in. to our Fed survey, Morgan, you told us earlier, our Morgan Brennan told us that there's a 100% chance right. that the Fed's going to do nothing tomorrow. It changed. It was it was 0% that they were going to cut. Now it's 0.2% the last time I checked. So that means they probably won't, right? I want to meet that The market point has already reacted to the fact that they're probably not going to cut rates. So and, I, I mean, and the market is, is in tune with the Fed's preference to do nothing for as long as possible. That's, I think, what the Fed prefers at this point. The next... Well, would we be okay with that? Would the stock market would be okay? I, I once right you now, take away the punch bowl, Mike? Really, is that all right? The punch bowl is still there because credit markets have completely rushed to a point where they're, they're giving money away. How come nobody's talking about what's going on in the repo market. I Everyone's mean, the Treasury, not us. We should. 
um, the re that, that's another, to my mind, a placebo that has worked. Basically, I mean, it, it sort of it forestalled a stress point in the markets, which was this repo issue. Now, the year-end question is now back in the air as to whether we're going to have more stress uh, for the year-end turn in, in repo. But uh, you know, I think it'll be interesting to see what Powell says tomorrow. Could it be a bigger deal that we're making, approach. Barbara? Quickly. Well, I think that you've had three central banks that are expanding the bank's balance sheet, and that doesn't flow through directly to the economy, but it tamps down volatility, and it's very helpful in the, in the uh, economic picture. All right, we're going to leave the conversation there. It's one I'm sure we'll continue to have, though. Barbara Duran and Liz Young, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Still to come, the streaming wars are heating up, and Needham is raising some red flags on Netflix. The analyst who sent shares lower by 3% today will make her case next. Plus, an exclusive interview with Goldman Sachs president and COO John Waldron. He'll weigh in on the firm's strategy for 2020. Coming up, closing bell is back in 90 seconds. I used to have more hair. I used to have more color. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? We've got you covered. With TuneIn Premium, you can listen to every NFL game live as it's happening. Sean McCoy has an opening on the right side, punches into the end zone for the touchdown. Or catch it later on demand. Offset backs behind Mahomes. The give is to Williams. Starts right, cuts it back to the left, and blows into the end zone for the touchdown. You call the plays. Follow the NFL anytime, anywhere, all season long with TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. Right now, instead of hearing this, you could be listening to the music that keeps you moving with TuneIn Premium. Find today's biggest songs and all of your favorites commercial free. Visit tunein.com slash premium to upgrade. Introducing a new podcast, ESPN Daily. When you want to go beyond your feed, when you want to get inside the score, when you want to get behind the highlight, there's ESPN Daily. Go deeper into the stories of the moment. Get the exclusive access and insider perspective that only ESPN can give you. ESPN Daily, hosted by me, Mina Kimes. Listen now to ESPN Daily on TuneIn. Well, rather quietly and all of a sudden, Netflix has become a battleground stock with analysts and investors really divided whether its boom has just begun or a bust could be around the corner. Laura Martin is internet and media analyst at Needham & Company joining the Bears today, really she's been kind of bearish, out with a note downgrading Netflix to an underperform, projected the company will lose 4 million U.S. subscribers in 2020 and stating, quote, Netflix must add a second lower price service to compete. Chief Content Officer Ted Sarandos giving evidence to the Bulls today, however, telling a UBS conference that Martin Scorsese's The Irishman was apparently viewed 26.4 million times or by 26.4 million accounts in the first seven days. Laura Martin joining us now on CNBC. Uh, Laura, there's so much to get to. First off, you've been right on Netflix. I mean, you were you downgraded the stock originally months and months and months ago. That was a spectacular call. Why sort of pile on? Why take the stock now to a sell? Because I mean, ca the catalyst here is Disney adding 16 million new accounts. We think that about half of those come from Netflix, or at least elevate the churn of Netflix. And the problem with Netflix, if it loses U.S. subs, is it loses its growth stock credentials. So it will no longer trade at seven times earnings, it will get, or seven times revenue, it will get revalued to 15 times EV to EBITDA, which is like a half on the stock price. So if you think it's going to or it needs to create a lower price second tier service to compete with Apple Plus and Disney Plus and everything like this, would that keep the subscribers around that you expect to leave or would it sort of bastardize the existing subs who then say, I'll stay on it, but I'm gonna cut my monthly payment in half because that's not the outcome Netflix would want. Right, no, so I think what happens is our data shows that they do two hours a day of viewing. If they added a six minute ad load, they could do $6 of ad revenue plus another $6 and convert some of those people who are stealing Netflix today. 25% of survey respondents admit to stealing somebody else's password so they could get some of those people to pay. And there's 30 million people that have never taken Netflix in any form because it's too expensive and they don't want to break the law. 
So getting some of those people to sign on to Netflix. Plus, I think in a marketplace, you must have a response to Apple and Disney at 5 to $7 a month. You can't just have a $13 response. So, Laura, one of the key points you're making here, and I think one of the key points you're, you're making you know, for this downgrade and, and lowering of the price target is the fact that if you are seeing a loss of domestic subscribers, that even as the, com- the company continues to expand into international, that it's not as lucrative. You've crunched those numbers. Break it down for us. Right. So one of the things I think people miss is that every incremental international sub is coming at a lower price and therefore a lower probability, profitability. So they, the profit per sub of U.S. subs was three times higher in the third quarter. And that's before Netflix added a $3 per month um, sub in India. So a lot of their international sub growth may come from India, but the profit per sub there is a fraction of the $1.90 profit per international sub, which is a third U.S. sub profitability. Okay, let's talk about viewership numbers, Laura. And I mean, I'm not good. Listen, you got to trust what Netflix puts out, right? You got to trust yeah. the numbers. However, I have a question. I don't know if you know the answer to. I certainly don't, which is this. They came out and they said 26.4 million accounts watch The Irishman in seven days. They view a watch as completing more than 70% of the movie. Take that for what it is. If I sit down to watch a three-hour movie and I watch an hour and I get up, have dinner with my family, I go back and watch an hour, then the next day I come back, is that three views or is that one view? Because everyone just takes these numbers for gospel and I, some of them just, they, they seem very large. Well, I think, Brian, if you have 60 million U.S. subscribers a month and half of them watch a single movie, that's great and 50% conversion is a great number, but I don't think it really speaks to whether those people pay next month. So for example, The Mandalorian is a huge hit on Disney+. Plus. It is quite possible that some subset of 60 million Netflix subs de- de- stops paying for Netflix, watches The Mandalorian for three months until it's over, and then goes back to Netflix. If 30% of Netflix people churn for an extra three months, they lose four million subs, or the equivalent revenue of losing four million subs all year. They don't need very much churn to start losing the equivalent subs, because they start with 60 million subs in the U.S. All right, Laura Martin, thank you for joining us on the heels of this downgrade. Stock finished the day down 3%, still ahead. We will get to the outlook for the market and the M&A landscape when we hear exclusively from Goldman Sachs President John Waldron. Plus, AutoZone. Yep, they sell batteries and spark plugs. The best performing stock in the S&P 500 today after reporting strong earnings. We're going to break down the charts, show why a profit beat is not the only reason, Morgan, for the stock surge today. Stick around. This CNBC program. This week at Tesco, buy two items from our chilled party food range, like tempura prawns or mozzarella sticks, and get a third one free. So for every two people you invite, you can ask another for free. But who? Linda from Accounts or Julio from Magaluf 2010. Tesco, delivering Christmas for 100 years. Cheapest item free selected stores while stocks last ends 1st of January. Want tune in to remind you when the big NFL game is about to get underway? Be sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search NFL on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear under events and tap Notify Me. We'll let you know exactly when it's time to listen in for kickoff. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. But we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn. With live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the UK, they're significantly worse. When the president gets up yeah. to the podium... CNBC got- and Fox News Talk... The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... You can use your stop and go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. 
The swagger of a perfect dunk. The rush of a three made from all the way downtown. The adrenaline surge of great defense. Can you feel the goosebumps yet? There's nothing like live NBA and nothing like listening live on TuneIn. Giannis down the lane to the rim. Going down. Right corner three. Another TuneIn one. TuneIn Premium brings you every minute of the NBA season so you can be there when it matters most. Never miss the action as it happens. Hear the ball you love. Hear it live on TuneIn. Search NBA Today to start listening. Hey, NFL fan. Can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. Hot. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards At the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. Again. Search NFL today. Hey, tune in listeners, Steve Kornacki here from NBC News. I want to tell you about a podcast I'm hosting called Article 2, Inside Impeachment. It's dedicated to bringing you the latest developments on the impeachment inquiry into President Trump. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I talk to NBC News reporters who are closest to the story to break down what's new, what matters, and what it means for the 2020 election. Search and favorite Article 2, Inside Impeachment on TuneIn. All right, we've got a pair of earnings alerts right now on both GameStop and Ollie's Bargain Outlet. Rahel Solomon joining us now with those numbers. Rahel. Hi, Brian. Two earnings and two very different stories. So let's start with GameStop plunging after hours after a disappointing quarter. A miss on the top and bottom lines. You can see GameStop down almost 20% right now. So EPS came in at a loss of 49 cents. The expectation had been a gain of 11 cents. Revenue, not much better. $1.44 billion. The street was hoping for $1.62 billion. Comps, comps down almost a quarter, 23.2% versus down 13.8%, which the street was expecting. Uh, George Sherman, GameStop's chief executive officer, is saying uh, in a press release that our third quarter results continue to reflect the prevailing industry trends, most notably the unprecedented decline in new hardware sales seen across the market and perhaps even worse. They expect these trends to continue into next quarter. Looking at guidance, EPS for fiscal year 19, uh, 10 cents to 20 cents adjusted versus the $1.21. So really not a good quarter for GameStop. And again, you can see they're down almost 20%. Very different story at bargain retailer Ollie's. A beat on the top and bottom. EPS came in at 41 cents versus the 38 cents uh, estimate revenue was $327 million versus the $323 million the street was expecting. Comps were down 1.4%. The expectation was 1.2%. They also named a new president and CEO who was the interim president and CEO. Morgan, I'll send it back to you. Rahel, thank you. Cloud-based gaming. We're seeing where it's uh, showing up in, in the numbers with competition. Let's hand it over to Mike Santoli for his third dashboard of the day. Mike. Morgan, uh, AutoZone obviously serves a lot of people who fix it themselves, fix their cars themselves, but AutoZone has also managed to fix it for their own shareholders. I'll tell you why. Here's a 10-year chart of this stock, one of the best performers you're going to find in retail or anywhere else. Look at this 10-year return, 705%. So that is share price, keep in mind. They've done it not just by growing steadily in terms of cash flows and earnings, but also by buying back their own shares very aggressively. Here's a breakdown of the change over the last 10 years in the stock price the market cap. So the stock's up 700%. The market cap's up only 250%, even with that stock price rise. Earnings per share up 450%. Why? Because shares outstanding over the last decade are down by more than half. This really shows the power of buybacks when the underlying company is also growing. So it's not just about buying back stock because you have no growth, like GameStop, by the way, has been doing for years. But when you have growth and uh, this formula, they just keep pursuing it, guys. Wow. Good. That breakdown is quite something. Mike Santoli, thank you. Up next, Goldman Sachs President John Waldron tells us exclusively what kind of impact the Apple card is having on his company's bottom line. Closing bell, we'll be right back. This CNBC program is cutting for the end. Scores! On the goal! fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. It tucks it home! And with this team, it's it's really fun to be a part of a team like that. You can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today.
Like what you're listening to? Want to make getting back to it easier? Use the favorite button to keep track of the stations and podcasts you love on TuneIn. Just tap or click the heart icon to add it to your favorites. Then find all your go-to audio under the favorites tab. Pretty easy, right? When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. into the end zone for the touchdown. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bates. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? we got you covered. With TuneIn Premium, you can listen to every NFL game live as it's happening. Sean McCoy has an opening on the right side, punches into the end zone for the touchdown. Or catch it later on demand. Offset backs behind Mahomes. The give is to Williams, starts right, cuts it back to the left, and blows into the end zone for the touchdown. You call the plays. Follow the NFL anytime, anywhere, all season long with TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Pascal gobbles up the rebound and slams it down. Catch your favorite NBA team right here on TuneIn. A step back, D3 is up and in. Search NBA on TuneIn and hear all the action. The NBA lives on TuneIn. Upgrade to TuneIn Premium and get over 45 commercial-free music stations. You'll also get live commercial-free news, plus live play-by-play games from NFL, MLB, NBA, and NHL. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. All right, welcome back. Let's get a CNBC News update now with Sue Herrera. Sue. Brian, thank you very much. Here's what's happening at this hour, everyone. An update now on the situation in Jersey City, New Jersey. One police officer has been killed. Two other officers and a civilian were wounded at a shootout at a store in New in Jersey City, New Jersey. Five people are dead inside the store, including three civilians and the two gunmen. Heavy gunfire rang out over the course of at least an hour earlier today. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo holding a joint news conference with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Lavrov was adamant that Russia did not meddle in the 2016 presidential election. We have highlighted once again that all speculations about our alleged interference in domestic processes in the United States are baseless. There are no facts that would support that. We did not see these facts. No one has um, given us this proof because it simply does not exist. And Pope Francis made a surprise visit to an exhibit of nativity scenes that just opened in Vatican City. More than 150 nativity scenes are on display at an exhibit hall next to St. Peter's Square. That exhibit runs until January 24th. I bet he surprised a lot of those people there. That is the news update, guys. You're up to date. I'll send it back to you, Morgan. I bet he did. Sue Herrera, th- Sue Herrera, thank you. Our Wilfred Frost joins us now from the Goldman Sachs Annual Financial Services Conference in New York. Hey, Wilf. Hey, Morgan. Uh, yes, uh, indeed. I'm delighted to be with the host of the conference, no less, as well, the uh, president and CEO of Goldman Sachs, John Waldron. John, thanks so much for having me. Thank you for being here. Thank you for covering our conference. No, it's great to be here, uh, as it always is. Uh, end of the year, people sort of setting out their stall expectations for the for the year ahead. What, what have been the key themes for you so far from, from all the banks we've heard, or heard from? Well, a lot of discussion about the economy uh, and the consumer in particular. The strength, the underlying strength in the consumer, I think, is showing through, and you're hearing people talk about it a lot today. Regulation uh, and the election and and the prospects of whether there might be some shift in the regulatory environment, which obviously affects banks meaningfully. And then I would say an an incremental conversation this year may be more pronounced than before around technology, the impact of technology, the amount of technology spend, where are we in the disruptive phase of financial services more broadly. That's become more of a prominent theme uh, that we think about at Goldman Sachs quite a lot, and it's certainly been um, a focus today with our clients. We'll definitely dive into what you guys are doing on that front uh, coming up. In terms of the the macro sentiment, is the consumer strong enough to be offsetting perhaps less lackluster, a little bit more lackluster kind of corporate uh, momentum? I mean, we're pretty constructive on the overall economy, uh, certainly in the United States in particular. The economy feels, if anything, like it might be accelerating again from mm-hmm. what had been a, a little bit more of a patchy 2019, certainly in the first half. I do think the Fed's uh, easing bias has, has made a big impact. You know, our financial conditions in, index is operating at a very 
uh, relatively historic low level. So we're seeing that that implication of easier policy coming through into the economy, and it's become much more uh, of a stimulant for particularly consumers, but in, in, but corporations as well. Manufacturing weaker, no question. But again, 70% of the U.S. economy is really driven by the consumer. So as goes the consumer, typically that's where the economy runs. And on the corporate side, we did see all of a sudden some M&A announced uh, last month. Did you guys take part in that? And are you optimistic that that can continue next year? Or was it kind of a last flurry, as it were, for, for 2019? Well, I think, again, consistent with a, an easing bias in monetary policy, a renewed risk appetite in the markets, I think increased improved sentiment in CEO offices and in boardrooms, we're seeing more M&A activity, and that's it's kind of the, the what you would have expected at this point. Our market shares are very good in M&A. We did participate in, in the vast majority of those transactions. We have more transactions that are on the docket. We feel good about where we are with our backlogs, and I think the activity levels have definitely elevated from where they would have been 30, 60 days ago. And what about IPO outlook? Has that been genuinely damaged by the whole uh, WeWork debacle? No, I don't think so. I think the IPO market is still fundamentally healthy. Uh, you know, you have individual transactions that come and go and have their own characteristics. But broadly speaking, there's demand for IPOs and there's a lot of supply coming. A number of good companies were doing IPO today in Brazil. That's going very well. So, you know, I think the market is, is, is doing quite well. Uh, to focus more on uh, Goldman Sachs, you guys have a very important strategy update coming in, in January. How are you guys all, all preparing for that? Well, we spent the better part of the year getting ourselves organized, uh, not just for the investor day, but for, for, the, for orienting the firm really for growth. And so when we, when we come out in January, we'll talk a bunch about that. Uh, we'll talk about our strategy. We'll talk about the direction uh, of travel in terms of our investing and what we're doing to build new businesses adjacent to our core franchises and some new businesses uh, like consumer, which are more new builds for us from, from the ground up. Uh, and we will have targets, you know, around profitability and efficiency. Uh, and so we'll talk more about that in January, but we're excited about it. So the FT article recently that suggested you're not going to be setting strict financial targets, I'd say the tone even suggested you were going to try and duck out uh, in that sense. Was that, was that a false uh, sentiment? I've, to I've, I've learned in this job you can't, you can't believe everything you read or hear on TV sometimes. Unless you say of course, not, of course not on your show. So we, we, we're grateful. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't believe everything you read in, uh, in any of the publications. What I, what I said is what, you'll, what you should expect to hear. And, and did David, Stephen, yourself, do, do you see this strategy update and, and of course the investor reaction to it? Do you see it as a kind of mark on your, your guys' first year in, in tenure? Is there a sense of nerves at all coming into this update? No, I don't think so. I think we're, we're excited about it because it's an opportunity for us to describe in more detailed terms what we're trying to achieve with the firm over a long period of time. And I think the over a long period of time part is going to be important. We really want to lay out a roadmap for where we're trying to go over a number of years. And that, that's something that I think will be a little bit different from what we've done in the years past, and we're looking forward to that. One of the themes that people, I guess, have heard a little bit about, but maybe not a, a full story about, is, is how much you want to shift towards the kind of private equity space. You've uh, reorganized internally to have a specific department to that. In, in five years' time, is that going to be 2% of earnings? Is it going to be 25% of earnings? Well, I don't want to make a prediction on how big it'll be, but I would say a couple things. We, we have a 30-year track record as in private asset classes, private equity, credit, real estate, et cetera. So we have a real business that's scaled. We haven't necessarily described it as such in, in more unified terms, which we will do more in a more detail in January. We think it's a secular growth opportunity in the world. You can see how hard it is to create alpha in the public markets. More money is flowing into private markets. As I said, we have a long track record, so we're very bullish on the opportunity, and we have a scaled business. So we're going to be an active player in that arena, and we're going to describe it in more detail as we, as we get into it in January. Are you nervous about the timing of that in any way, whether that's because issues like WeWork showing that the private market valuations in some areas at least might, might have peaked already? And on top of that, we've seen price wars in active management to public equity the brokers as well. Could private equity not be the next area to see a price war? Again, we're not making a market call on being in the alternative business. Uh, this is a long-term bet that we're making that this is a secular growth opportunity and we have a reason for being. We have unique attributes. We've got a very big sourcing engine in our investment banking business, which lots of our clients want to access. And we can, we can have our own private equity and credit and real estate opportunities to access that as well in partnership with our clients. We also have a unique, I think, ability to talk to our institutional clients about risk management, allocation of capital, and we can offer them products that can help them do that in a more uh, intelligent manner. So we think we bring a lot of unique things to the table, and we're very excited about the opportunity to build an even bigger alternatives business over time. You mentioned uh, the spend on tech as a theme that's come out uh, at the conference, and we've seen that play out recently in a subsector in, in, the, in the brokers. Robinhood enters, 
uh, it leads to a price war and, and then leads to some cons consolidation amongst the big players, Schwab and TD Ameritrade, announcing a deal. Do you think of Goldman Sachs as a tech challenger or as the incumbent being challenged? Well, it's a good question. I think we probably sit in both seats. You know, we have a lot of legacy businesses uh, where you could see some challenge to legacy ways of doing business, and we have some businesses that would be more disruptive. I would say what we're doing in the consumer arena would probably tend to be more disruptive. We're trying to build a digital storefront, a digital bank of the future. That's more disruptive versus what would be the legacy infrastructure in consumer. In the markets businesses, we're trying to be ahead of the curve, almost disrupting ourselves in many respects, to have straight through processing and other platform capability when you move from more voice legacy transmission of risk intermediation into more platform and technology. So in that case, we're probably trying to make sure we're disrupting ourselves, we're not getting disrupted by others. And on the consumer side, we're, we're more of a disruptor. I'd say in transaction banking, it's a combination of the two. We're building a new platform. It will be disruptive. We think it'll be a great product. We think it'll be an improvement on what's in the marketplace. But we're also taking advantage of, of legacy existing corporate relationships that are quite strong and important in a trusted advisory uh, context where we, can, where we can offer something else that's you know, part of our toolkit that will be valuable to our clients. That, that broker price war obviously led to some suppressed prices and, and the Schwab TD deal uh, came about partly because of that. Some people criticize your uh, predecessor, um, uh, the leadership uh, that came before you and David, for not making more moves when prices were depressed after the crisis, not being acquisitive then. Have you sensed any opportunities at the moment? Uh, people have tried to link Goldman Sachs to E-Trade, for example. Well, we're not going to comment on individual names, but we, we did make an acquisition in the wealth space recently, a company called United Capital, uh, which is an RIA, a national platform in the United States that's, that's, that's got a, a very good kind of high net worth uh, wealth platform that mm -hmm. we're, that we're going to build upon. So when we see opportunities that allow us to accelerate our existing organic plans, we're going to look hard and, and want to access those opportunities. But the bar for doing something more transformational or of larger scale is very, very high and will continue to be so. Um, let's move on to the Apple card uh, in partnership with you guys. Uh, David said on the recent earnings call, which I discussed with him when I interviewed him recently, that it was the most successful credit card launch ever. Uh, the numbers may say that. I wonder whether you guys retract at least part of that sentiment, given the scandal that came up about potential gender bias in terms of the, the credit issuing decisions. Was that a blow? Well, the, the, the way I think about this is we're, we're starting a new business. It's in partnership with Apple. It's the first real credit card launch in a long time. And it's going well. We've got a lot of new customers. The usage rates are very high. We're feeling very good about how the processing is working. The, the tech platform is working very, very well. Apple's a great partner, and so there's a lot to be very, very pleased about, and we'll talk more about the details of that, obviously, in the, mm -hmm. in the coming weeks and months ahead. Vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the, the gender um, question that, was, you know, that you asked around the, the you know, credit approval process, we're very comfortable. There's no gender bias in our approval process. It's quite easy to go look at that. You can look at it on the phone in terms of what the factors are that, that, uh, that drive the approval process. There's no gender. There's no marital status, so we don't, we don't believe there's any gender issue at all. We do think we may be, um, you know, a, 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 have an ability to go talk to the world about the fact that it may be harder for, um, for women, as an example, to get credit. Uh, and so we may be, you know, shining a spotlight a little bit on that, which I think is a good thing to be talking about in the world. But we don't, we don't believe we have any bias in our, in our processes. Uh, in terms of the card itself, Apple announced today that you can buy an iPhone spread over 24-month installments with no interest if you use the Goldman Sachs Apple card. So is that, uh, you have to forego the interest or Apple compensates you for that? T talk us through that. Well, I don't want to talk about our economic relationship with Apple, but it's another example of where we're trying to be innovative and, and help the consumer. The whole, the whole basis under which we're doing this, this Apple card with Apple as our partner is simplicity, ease of use, transparency, and trying to be sort of democratize, if you will, financial wellness out in the world. And Apple is a great partner for that. First of all, they've got a lot of customers on the phone, and so it's very easy to access those customers. Mm -hmm. And we're trying, to, we're trying to mimic a lot of what Apple does well anyway, which is to be very simple and easy to use and allow people to have tools at their disposal to make their life better. I want to ask you about uh, 1MDB. On the earnings call, Stephen Scher said that during the quarter, we elected to suspend our open market repurchases as we begun discussions with certain U.S. governmental authorities with respect to the resolution of the 1MDB matter. Since then, last week uh, and just the week before, both the U.S. and Malaysian 
uh, sides have seen stories suggest that you're close to a settlement, and, and they've not come out to outright deny those stories. So I feel like there's a sense in the market that you guys are very close to a settlement. Is this something that will be done in Q1? Very hard to predict the timing of any of this. All I can say is that we, we are working uh, to try to solve this as expeditiously as possible. We don't control all the outcome, obviously. Mm-hmm. We're one party. We have a number of people to talk to. Uh, and that's really all I can say. But we're, you know, we're working as hard as we can to try to get it, to try to get it resolved um, sensibly. Do, do you feel like it's suppressing the share price if people say it's been trading at or, or below price to book value? Do you think settlement of this is something that would see it go back above that? that threshold? I wouldn't say we're really particularly focused on the impact it has or doesn't have on our share price at the moment. We'd like to get it settled. We'd like to get it resolved. We'd like to get focused on, on you know, all the other good things that we're working on, and that's where we'd like to be spending our time and energy. Um, the final question, John, which uh, I think lots of people are genuinely really interested in it. We all know that uh, David enjoys uh, some downtime DJing. What was your number one hobby outside of outside of work my number one hobby is i have six children <laughs> uh, and so they they are my number one hobby i, I coach my son's hockey team and i uh, spend a lot of time with my daughter and her travel soccer team and that occupies most of my time so i'm not spending a lot of time doing much else other than working at goldman sachs and being with my family well that hobby is uh, much much more important than the job but uh, it's great to discuss the job with you thanks for, ha- for having us for the conference appreciate Enjoy. the time thank great you great to see you as always thanks guys i'll send it back to you uh, at the stock exchange Wilfred Frost and John Wall. Six kids, Wilf? Six kids. You heard it. You heard it from, from the source himself. The guy's the president of one of the world's biggest and most important banks, chief operating officer. He's got six children. There's got to be two of them. There's no way it's like one guy, Wilfred. Thank you. <laughs> Your words, not mine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, Goldman Sachs, an important yeah. company, Michael. Pretty Sachs. good articulation of, I think, how they're trying to approach things, um, utilizing the platform of being a, v- a vast global uh, bank, having to make a